Okay, so hello and welcome to our uh, Zoom education session on new research in dementia. Uh, so thank you for joining us today for this discussion. Uh, my name is uh, Shelby Berry and with me today is Chris Van Leuven. And we are both education coordinators here at the Alzheimer's Society of uh, Peterborough, Cortha Lakes, Northumberland, and Halliburton. So in today's presentation, uh, we are going to focus on um, new and upcoming uh, dementia research in Canada that is being funded by the Alzheimer's Society Research Program. So we recognize that throughout our presentation and discussion today, there may be several questions that come up. And just in the interest of time, and because I'm not always able to see the chat pod, uh, well, while sharing the PowerPoint screen, we would like to ask you to hold those questions until the end of the presentation. If you, you know, want to make sure that you know you keep that question in mind, you're welcome to write it in the chat pod, and we will check that chat pod at the end of the presentation. So thank you in advance for that. So here's an overview of what our presentation will look like today. So we're going to start by uh, telling you about the Alzheimer's Society Research Program, you know, what it is, how long it's been around for, you know, how, how much funding they've provided to research in Canada. We will also take some time to look at the 10 priorities for dementia research in Canada. And then we will take uh, some time to highlight some of the a new research in Canada. So what we're going to be looking at specifically are uh, the, the 2022 Alzheimer's Society Research Program uh, grant recipients and, and the research projects that they are in charge of. So many of these projects are, are just starting. So, you know, those specific findings aren't available yet uh, and will take some years to complete, but it's exciting to see, you know, what, what's up and coming in that dementia research in Canada. And then we will also go over uh, where you can learn more and get involved. You know, I'm sure many people today have come in with maybe something that they're curious about with with regards to research, um, but with there being so much research going on in, in Canada and around the world, you know, it might not be something that comes up specifically today. So we'll let you know of, of maybe some other areas where you can get information on research as well. And then we will um, conclude our presentation and also have time for questions at the end. So before we begin our discussion about uh, new research, it's really important to look at the statistics around dementia in Canada at this time. By knowing the numbers, uh, we can gain a clear understanding of the impact of dementia on our current healthcare and economic systems, and in turn, why research is so important in this field. So right now, there are over 597,000 Canadians living with dementia in Canada. And that's really a staggering number. That being said, that does not really describe the true impact that dementia has on Canadian society. In fact, it is estimated that for every person that is living with dementia, at least 10 other people associated with that person are impacted, whether they are family members, friends, neighbors, or coworkers, for example. If you find that number higher than you thought possible, what is even more staggering is that if we do not find a cure for dementia, it is estimated that 955,900 Canadians will be living with dementia by the year 2030. And 2030 isn't that far off, you know, when we think about that. In 2020 alone, 124,000 Canadians were diagnosed with dementia. And those are just the individuals that received, you know, that formal diagnosis. There are lots of Canadians that may be living with the symptoms of dementia, but that have not received a formal diagnosis from a healthcare provider. 
We are, we are often asked as well if dementia is more common in men or women. And as you can see from the statistic here on the slide, we know that over 61% of those living with dementia in Canada are women. And women are um, more likely to live longer than men and age is the biggest risk factor for uh, a dementia or Alzheimer's disease. So that might be a factor. However, stress, uh, reproductive history, and decline in estrogen uh, because of menopause may all play a role in this statistic as well. So let's keep these numbers in mind as we be begin to explore the research that's taking place all across Canada. You know, these statistics really help to support, you know, the need for research and the need for advancements um, in dementia research as well. So as I mentioned today, we're going to be highlighting the Alzheimer's Society Research Program and the research that, that they help fund in Canada. So what is the Alzheimer's Society Research Program? So the Alzheimer's Society Research Program is one of Canada's most innovative hubs for dementia research, helping the best and brightest minds in the field spark their work from ideas to impact. The Alzheimer's Society Research uh, Program is a, a research funding competition for new and established investigators, trainees, and those uh, seeking grants to fund their research proposals, and they're often applying from institutions all across Canada. And the Alzheimer's Society Research Program is changing dementia research in Canada. So since the program started in 1989, the program has invested over $67 million in grants and awards uh, toward innovative research that brings us closer to a future without Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. So the Alzheimer's Society Research Program has two goals. The first goal is to encourage researchers to explore um, radical new ways to advance our knowledge of dementia. And the second goal is to improve the quality of life for people living with dementia, their families, and their caregivers. So applicants to the Alzheimer's Society Research Program are highly reviewed by experts in clinical and research fields that, who have extensive uh, experience in dementia. The projects they propose are often unique, focus, focusing solely on the determinants of health for those affected by dementia. Students who apply um, are, are supervised by leading experts while pursuing their academic and professional goals in dementia research. And through the Alzheimer's Society uh, research program funding, their research can make uh, an impactful difference to those living with dementia, their family and friends and caregivers, and those working to support them. So the image here shows the Alzheimer's Society uh, research program's eight funding priorities and how they are weighed when the, that funding is allocated. So if you're like me and you were wondering what is translational, what does the translational category mean? Um, I had to look that up myself and it says translational research is research that takes um, scientific discoveries made in the laboratory, in the clinic or out in the field and transforms them into new treatments and approaches um, to medical care that improves the health of the population. So that's why you can see kind of that arrow from microscope to uh, the doctor in that image. So as we go over some of the uh, new research uh, projects that the Alzheimer's Society Research Program is funding, you will see that we have outlined which funding priority the project fell under so that you can kind of get an idea of, of that connection between the funding priorities and the type of projects that the person is doing. So I'm going to hand it over to Chris now to explore the 10 priorities for dementia research in Canada. Great, well, thanks Shelby. So recently uh, a study that was known as the Canadian Dementia Priority Setting Partnership was completed and 
it really set out to identify the top 10 research priorities and to share them with Canadian researchers and research funding organizations. So 1,200 Canadian participants, either affected personally by dementia or, you know, through their work, um, they shared their insights that informed this study. The Canadian Dementia Priority Setting Partnership asked these Canadians who are affected by dementia um, about their unanswered questions related to living with dementia and dementia prevention, treatment, and diagnosis. These questions were used to identify the top 10 priorities for dementia research in Canada by persons with dementia, their friends, their family and care partners, um, as well as health and social care providers. The Alzheimer's Society of Canada Research Program has committed to incorporating these identified priorities to help bring the voices of Canadians affected by dementia into their research agenda. We know that research is vital to finding better ways to prevent, diagnose, and treat dementia and improve the quality of life of those affected by it. The results of the Canadian Dementia Priority Setting Partnership study identified 10 specific areas of focus. And these top 10 priorities will be at the core of how research projects are selected for funding by the ASRP, um, which really will help to set the course for de future dementia research. So up on the screen, you can see the first half of the list of these top 10 research priorities. And the first is addressing stigma. So here they're looking at the impact of stigma, uh, sorry, stigmatizing beliefs associated um, with people living with dementia and finding effective ways at reducing stigma experienced by people with dementia, their friends, their families, and their care partners. Next on the list, we have emotional well being. So, here we're asking the question what can be done to support the emotional well being of people living with dementia? And that includes, you know, their, their ability to live with dignity. Number three is the impact of early treatment. So, what is the impact of early treatment on quality of life, disease progression, and cognitive symptoms? Four is health system capacity. How can the health system build and sustain the capacity to meet the health and the social care needs of people living with dementia, along with their friends and families um, and their care partners as well? And number five on this list is caregiver support. So here they're asking the question, what services, supports, and therapies are available for care partners and caregivers uh, of people living with dementia, along with people living with dementia that would help to improve their and maintain their health, um, their well being, their quality of life as well? Number six is access to information and services post-diagnosis. So after dementia is diagnosed, what would help people living with dementia and their care partners um, to get the information, the treatment, the care and services that they may need? Number seven is care provider education. What dementia-related skills and knowledge should health and social care providers have um, what are effective ways of providing them with these skills and with this knowledge? Number eight is dementia-friendly communities. So here they're asking what enables the creation of a dementia-friendly community and what impact do dementia-friendly initiatives have on people with living with dementia, their family members, friends, caregivers, and care partners? Number nine um, is implementation of best practices for care. What would ensure implementation and sustainability of best practices for dementia care 
within and across healthcare settings. Um, and that includes effective approaches to providing that person-centered care. And lastly, on the list of top 10 priorities is non-drug approaches to managing symptoms. So among people living with dementia, what are the effects of non-pharmacological compared to pharmacological treatments on behavior and psychological symptoms of dementia? Can non-pharmacological treatments replace, reduce, or be used in conjunction with pharmacological treatments uh, for managing those behavioral changes um, or psychological symptoms of dementia? So as you can see, funding priorities include not only the basic science research, clinical research, health services, and population health, but other important factors which can impact those living with, supporting, or working with people who are living with dementia. And you can read all about the work of the funded Alzheimer's Society research program recipients um, and what aspects of research, research that they're pursuing by visiting alzheimer.ca um, and navigating to the research tab that you can see at the top of, of that website screen. You can also see past funding recipients um, and the research that they've been working on. And the top 10 priorities that we just discussed are also listed there on the website. Now that we have an understanding of those research priorities, let's talk about what's new and what's exciting in research. For 2022, the Alzheimer's Society Research Program has selected 30 research projects and they've invested $3.5 million in grant and award funding. Over the next slides, we're gonna highlight and learn about some of the researchers and the projects that are making an impact on dementia in Canada. And during our time, we're not really gonna be able to highlight all 31 researchers and all 30 of their projects. However, you are welcome to visit uh, the Alzheimer's Society of Canada website to learn more about each researcher that received funding and the project that was funded. So let's get started. Our first, uh, the first researcher that we, we kind of selected to talk about today is uh, Dr. Figgies, and he is leading a project titled Precision Prebiotics to Target the Gut Microbiome in Alzheimer's Disease. Um, that sounds like quite a, a mouthful. This falls under that trans translational funding category that Shelby explained uh, a couple slides back. Um, so this is what Dr. Figgy says about this project. So the microbes or microbiome that live in the gut are akin to a factory that produces many compounds, also known as metabolites, that are important in Alzheimer's disease. The composition and function of the microbiome is different in people with Alzheimer's disease. Recently, it was shown that controlling the levels of specific gut microbiome metabolites can improve cognition. This is the first step in the development of precision microbiome nutrition for people living with Alzheimer's disease. Precision microbiome nutrition will empower people living with Alzheimer's disease as changing diet is something that's under their control. And Dr. Figgy says, our research, we hope, will guide individual nutrition uh, strategically to improve cognition. That is Dr. Figgy's uh, take um, and, and what he's pursuing. So he was a recipient in 2022. So we don't have any results of his study yet, uh, but we're really intrigued to find out what happens. The next one we're gonna look at is titled, Imagining and Promoting Compassionate End-of-Life Care for People Living with Dementia Using Documentary Film. And this is a project by Dr. Sherry Dupuy and Dr. Pia Contos from the University of Waterloo and the University Health Network. And this falls under the CARE funding category. So the researchers say this about this project. People living with dementia suffer painful, 
inhumane and overtreated end of life due to the biomedical approach to care. Few studies have explored the perspectives of people living with dementia, especially from diverse backgrounds or identities. Fewer still have explored end of life experiences from the perspective of all involved. So that's people with dementia, uh, family and professionals. The documentary will facilitate conversations about end of life wishes, foster critical reflection about harmful end of life practices and highlight what is necessary for compassionate relational end of life care. The intent is to improve end of life experiences. Our team has significant experience creating research-based films that challenge stigma, expose inhumane policies and practices and humanize dementia care. Next, we have uh, a project by Dr. Ramasamy of the University of Quebec. And the title of his project is Role of Periodontists in Alzheimer's Disease. So periodontis is also called gum disease and it's a serious gum infection that damages the soft tissue around the teeth. Without treatment, periodontis can destroy the bone that supports your teeth. This can cause teeth to loosen or lead to tooth loss. Periodontist is common, but can usually be prevented. And a periodontist is a dentist who specializes in gum disease. So Dr. Ramasamy says about this project, recent studies suggest that oral dysbiosis is associated with inflammatory diseases and are linked to Alzheimer's disease. And I'll take a moment here just to explain what oral dysbiosis is. So a healthy mouth has a balance of bacteria and when poor oral health occurs, the diversity of bacteria narrows and some bacteria become more dominant. And this shift is called oral dysbiosis. So Dr. Ramasamy continues to say that it's not clear how these circulating microbes could induce neurodegeneration, uh, but his study will uh, study a mechanism by which these microbes can reach the brain. And this research will shed light on the key role of oral microbes in Alzheimer's disease and will identify patients at risk to develop Alzheimer's disease with these accessible markers. There's a, the first kind of taste of the research that's been funded and I'm gonna hand things over to Shelby now to talk about a few more of the projects. Great, thank you, Chris. So um, yes, in continuing to highlight the the recipients of the Alzheimer's Society Research Program funding. Um, our next one up here is um, Dr. Uh, Tak Pan Wong. And the title of his research is The Role of Cannabidiol in Ameliorating. Ameliorating is a fancy word for to make better or more tolerable. So the role of cannabidiol in ameliorating neuronal hyperactivity a cellular change during the prodromal phase of Alzheimer's disease. So prodromal, just to define that as well, some of these are very uh, scientific uh, terms and words, but prodromal means um, that period of uh, subclinical signs or symptoms that precedes the onset of those major signs and symptoms that we might see kind of on the outside. So. That, that period of time where things are changing before we actually see those symptoms. So uh, what he says about this research project is that before cognitive decline, um, enhanced neuronal activity in the hippocampus is a prodromal change in Alzheimer's disease. Reducing hippocampal hyperactivity at that prodromal stage has been shown to rescue brain dysfunction and cognitive decline. Cannabidiol, which is an active ingredient of cannabis um, that's often used for treating seizures, could be useful for reducing the neuronal hyperactivity. So um, what, 
what uh, Dr. Tak Pim Wong says is that we can expect cannabidiol um, can rescue hypocampal hyperactivity and cognitive deficits of, uh, it's a long kind of word, but a certain type of mice uh, that, they, that they use in the lab. And these findings may support the use of cannabidiol for preventing Alzheimer's disease. The project's feasibility is supported by our experience in using uh, the, the mini scope and in examining hypocampal hyperactivity in this specific set of mice. Um, so that highlights one of the projects he's taking on, which follows, falls under that funding category of treatment. Our next uh, project and, and the lead researcher is Dr. April, um, April Codemy, and she's with the Toronto Metropolitan University. And her research is looking at um, the analysis of cerebral vascular disease. So again, I'll, I'll define that for you because um, she mentions it so, you know, a few times. So cerebral vascular disease refers to a group of conditions that affects uh, blood flow and the blood vessels in the brain. So problems with blood flow may occur from blood vessels narrowing, which medically is called stenosis, uh, because of a clot formation, which is called thrombosis, because of an artery blockage, uh, which can is often referred to as an embolism, or because of a blood vessel rupture, uh, which is referred to as a hemorrhage. So that, that kind of group of those conditions that affect the blood flow is known as cerebrovascular disease. So going back to the title of her research, um, what, what uh, she's looking at is the analysis of cerebrovascular disease biomarkers and dementia in large neuroimage cohorts. So um, what Dr. Uh, Kadami has to say about the research is that there is a growing interest in understanding vascular contributions to dementia and Alzheimer's disease since cerebrovascular disease presents an avenue for early treatment before irreversible brain damage occurs. And she says, while there's some consensus regarding the correlation between cerebrovascular disease and dementia, the relationship um, is not fully understood. So they're trying to explore that more here. So she says how she will do this is she will apply um, software tools to uh, the MRI of the brain developed over the last 10 years and correlate vascular disease markers to cognition. And she said the goal is to find early markers of disease that could be used as treatment targets and improve the understanding about the mechanisms of the disease. So that's uh, uh, in the funding category of, of risk. And, you know, one of those ones, many of these projects will take a few years to complete. Um, so, you know, you may see them, you know, one day in the news with maybe some of those results. But, you know, we really look forward to seeing some of those outcomes. All right, the next uh, research project uh, that received funding from the program uh, is is led by the lead researcher, uh, Louise Castillo. And Louise uh, uh, won or got this grant as a, a doctoral award. So she's still a student um, who's, who's pursuing her PhD. So her research is focusing on the development and preliminary uh, evaluation of an app to reduce caregiver stress and burden among informal caregivers of of people living with dementia. And what she has to say about the project is that family caregivers of people living with dementia experience burden associated with providing care. These stressors can negatively affect their mental health. And interventions that focus on building skills and support have been shown to successfully improve caregiver mental health. She says that mobile apps can aid in delivering these services easily and cost-effectively. 
So what she says is that the results from the study can lead to faster delivery of, of services through the development of an accessible app for caregivers. Given the demands the caregivers of people living with dementia face daily, the creation of an app that aims to provide support has the potential of improving the quality of life of caregivers. So, you know, that's really exciting research. We have, um, you know, almost an app for everything uh, these days. So to see that they're pursuing this uh, as, a, as a resource for caregivers is great to see. Okay, the next research project is um, led by Dr. Sean uh, Whitehead, who is uh, at the University of Western Ontario. And the title of this project, again, requires a little bit of a scientific uh, breakdown of, of some of the terms. Um, but what he's looking at is uh, circulating microglia extracellular vesicles as diagnostic indicators of Alzheimer's disease. So I'll break down some of those terms for you again. So microglia are the resident cells of the brain that regulate uh, brain development, maintenance of the neuronal networks, and injury repair. Extracellular vesicles are membrane-bound vesicles which play a role in cell-to-cell -cell communication. And extracellular vesicles are released from the host cell, so from that microglia um, cells in the brain, into extracellular space and have been found in many bodily fluids, such as urine or blood or saliva, for example. So going back to... Um, to his research, um, Dr. Whitehead says, the aging and early stage Alzheimer's disease brain are vulnerable to damage caused by chronic inflammation. He says, additionally, inflammation occurs early in Alzheimer's disease, often decades prior to severe memory loss and impairment of daily activities. He says the outcome of this work will allow for the detection of extracellular vesicle profiles that represent a novel blood-based screening approach for early detection of Alzheimer's disease. This will allow for the identification of individuals at risk of future Alzheimer's disease who may respond to future therapeutics. So as you can see, the funding category for this falls under diagnosis, you know, as, as he says, they're hopeful that this research will help with, um, with that early detection. Okay, back over to Chris to highlight a few more of the projects that were funded. Yeah, thanks, Shelby. So uh, the next project we're gonna look at is called Implementing a Dementia-Friendly Care Approach for cancer patients living with dementia. And, and this uh, research is being led by Dr. Shelley Canning of the University of Fraser Valley. So it's based in BC, um, but I'm imagining that, you know, her findings uh, will translate across our country um, later on. The number of people living with both cancer and dementia is increasing they have worse outcomes than those who do not have dementia. Currently, BC cancer care systems fail to recognize the unique needs of these patients and caregivers, and care providers have limited education and expertise related to dementia care. Current care challenges experienced by cancer, pa cancer patients living with dementia, caregivers, and care providers will be identified and addressed through implementing dementia-friendly education and recommendations at BC Cancer, so British Columbia Cancer. Anticipated results include patients and caregivers experiencing decreased stigma, improved communication, easier to navigate environments, and more flexible care pathways. So uh, as we know, these are these projects are just recently funded, and, and this project happens to be a three-year study. So it's really just getting off the ground, um, and, and they'll be exploring kind of the, the outcomes of, of their tests and, and studies here 
over the next three years. Next, we have a study called The Effects of a Listening Program of Autobiog Autobiographically Salient Music on Cognitive Measures and Underlying Neural Mechanisms in Early Stage Dementia. And this project is being led by Veronica Huang, who is a student at the University of Toronto. Uh, and uh, this is also a doctoral award. So she's uh, working on her doctorate and it falls under the funding category of treatment. And this is what Veronica says about the study. Increasing evidence shows that listening to music from childhood and early adulthood can help recall meaningful events from the past. Importantly, people with dementia have shown to benefit from listening to long known music, suggesting that musical memory remains preserved. However, the underlying mechanisms by which music improves memory remains unclear. Alternative interventions have become increasingly urgent due to the lack of pharmacological progress. And understanding the neural mechanisms by which long known music listening may promote changes in the brain and result in cognitive improvements is critical to establishing music-based interventions as a safe, low cost, feasible and enjoyable treatment for people living with dementia. Our next study is called Targeting Cognitive De Decline in Alzheimer's Disease by Modulating Body Temperature. And it's by researcher, Dr. Jeffrey Kinnett from the University of Laval. And it also falls under the funding category of therapy. Um, and so this is what Dr. Jeffrey Kinnett says about this project. Tau protein is essential for the brain and undergoes modifications called phosphorylation. In Alzheimer's disease, toxic aggregates of hyperphosphorylated tau are found inside neurons. Hypothermia was identified as a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease, notably by increasing tau, phosphor tau phosphorylation. Conversely, so on the other hand, sauna bathing um, by increasing body temperature is beneficial for Alzheimer's disease. We hope that such increase in body temperature will decrease tau pathology and thus restore memory performances of the animals on which they're completing this testing. Understanding such mechanisms will provide an explanation for the beneficial effects of sauna, and will aid in the development of treatments or lifestyle strategies to control the advancement of Alzheimer's disease. And next we have um, a project by Dr. Eleftherios Diamandis, and it's titled Delineating the Autoimmune Component of Alzheimer's Disease. Uh, and it's under the funding category of cause. There is strong evidence of a strong autoimmune com component in Alzheimer's disease. So here he, he's got kind of two part evidence. So the first is that immune cells are absent from normal brain parenchyma, but consistently found in uh, brains affected by Alzheimer's disease. And I'm just gonna take a moment to describe what brain parenchyma means. So brain parenchyma is the functional tissue in the brain, and it's composed of two types of cells that are spe used specifically for cognition and controlling the rest of the body. The brain parenchyma consists of neurons and glial cells. The second uh, piece of evidence that um, there's a strong autoimmune component in Alzheimer's disease is that animal data shows that pathological antibodies in the brain promote neuroinflammation. An ant autoantibody is an antibody or immune protein 
that mistakenly target and react with a person's own tissues or organs. One or more autoantibodies may be produced when a person has an autoimmune disorder and their immune system fails to distinguish between self and non-self. And the third kind of piece of evidence that there's a strong autoimmune component in Alzheimer's disease is that there's a strong genetic association between autoimmune dysfunction and the risk for Alzheimer's disease. So Dr. Giamondis says already, along with amyloid hypothesis, other ideas, including autoimmunity, our own, uh, and infectious agents like viruses and bacteria are now gaining traction. Our suggestion, if proven, could catalyze development of new preventative and therapeutic immunomodulating therapeutic innovations for Alzheimer's disease. All right, <laughs> we still have a few more studies to cover, so I'll pass it back over to Shelby. Okay, so the next um, research project that was funded, um, the lead researcher is Dr. Heather Keller at the University of Waterloo. And her project is called um, Cooking Together, uh, co-design, feasibility, and pilot testing of an intergenerational program for food preparation for youth and persons living with dementia. And this falls under that, that translational category. So uh, what Dr. Keller has to say about the project is that cooking and eating together are meaningful intergenerational activities. Food has the power to bring people together and to reduce stigma. Currently, no cooking programs uh, designed to mutually engage both youth and persons living with dementia exist. We will rigorously develop and conduct initial testing of an innovative program called Cooking Together. The concept of Cooking Together is, is high risk, but potentially high reward. Through careful stepwise development and testing, Cooking Together will be ready for a future study that confirms its benefits to uh, people living with dementia, you know, with regards to their quality of life, and the benefits to youth as well in terms of enhancing their knowledge of dementia and in turn helping to reduce stigma as well. Okay, so the next uh, researcher is Dr. Marie Savadraneagam, and she is at the University of Western Ontario. And the project that she is leading there is um, optimizing the foundation to transform dementia care training using virtual reality. And this falls under that uh, funding category of care. So she says here that personal support workers or PSWs provide the most formal uh, care to people living with dementia. Their formal training often does not address complex dementia related communication impairments and responsive behaviors. So she says our research team created Be Epic which is an innovative program that trains um, PSWs to use person-centered communication. Uh, and this, the virtual reality component, component here is using a simulated um, person living with dementia. So the simulate, simulation program will help um, PSWs communicate and interact with Nala and James, who are two uh, lifelike avatars representing people in their mid 70s in the middle stages of dementia. And uh, she says, we chose to develop this again with PSWs because they're the people who provide that hands-on care and are often the people who are most uh, forgotten about when it comes to innovation that can help them with their work. They want the training and often don't have access to it. So she, she goes on to explain that the program is called um, Be Epic VR, so the virtual reality version of, of the program. And the training program will be highly interactive and highly personalized in its approach and in its evaluation. She says, 
Nala's and James' responses to the PSW's comments and questions will be guided by artificial intelligence to make the avatars part of the dialogue as authentic and seemingly um, improv improvisational as possible. And she says that, you know, standard PSW training addresses many how-to skills, you know, such as techniques for feeding, bathing, and transferring patients from beds to chairs. Uh, and the list of duties for each person can be so long and time consuming that they can have that tendency to be more task focused and less person focused. And you know, here she talks about how important it is to still provide that, that person-centered care despite all of those tasks. So she says, this project is about inclusivity on all fronts, including the needs of the PSW and the person living with dementia. So as part of that project, she says, we will gather data from uh, the PSWs and their managers to identify factors that influence the successful Im implementation of this BEPIC virtual reality in both home care and long-term care settings. Uh, identifying those factors that are influencing implementation is that essential first step toward using the BEPIC virtual reality to transform dementia care training. So that's We've been hearing a lot about things like virtual reality and artificial intelligence in the news lately. So to see that that's being applied to dementia care um, is an exciting aspect of research as well. Okay, our next researcher is Dr. Violet D'Souza at Dalhousie University. And um, what she's looking at here is cognitive decline and oral health. And this falls under that uh, funding category of epidemiology. So looking at that, you know, uh, in a larger population. So what she says here is older individuals with cognitive decline often have age-related conditions and depend on caregivers for their normal day-to-day -day activities, including mouth care. Disability, uh, dependency on caregivers, inadequate mouth, mouth care, and lack of access to dental services can increase their risk for oral diseases that can cause pain and increase their suffering. She says, this study will enable us to make recommendations for policy change and design targeted future interventions such as health promotion resources and policy recommendations to address the oral care needs of individuals with dementia. These interventions will include the voices of, of care providers, caregivers, care recipients uh, when possible, and substitute decision makers as well. So we went through a lot of uh, different research projects there that uh, the Alzheimer's Society Research Program is funding. And you know, in conclusion here, even if, if we don't always hear about it, um, researchers across Canada, you know, across our country are working hard to make life better for people living with dementia and their care partners. So we hope that you've enjoyed learning about uh, the 10 priorities for dementia research in Canada and some of the research projects that receive that funding in the 2022 um, research uh, recipients awards and grants. So um, Chris is just going to go over now some information about where you can learn more about research. You know, as we know, research is probably like an endless topic. Um, so there are some spots where you can find more information. Absolutely. Yeah. So if this topic was of interest to you, I would encourage you to really check out the Alzheimer's Society website at alzheimer.ca. Um, there's a tab called research where you can learn more about the Alzheimer's Society research program. Um, and you can also learn more about Canadian researchers and even how to get involved as a participant, if that's something that's of interest to you. Uh, and that's website is where Shelby and I uh, found all of the information for today's presentation. The ASRP provides grants and awards to support Canadian studies that promise new insights into causes, prevention, diagnosis, treatment, 
and management of Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. So you can see in the image on the screen there, um, if you visit our website, you can go right to that research tab. Uh, and then there's a whole menu on the left-hand side about all of the different research-related topics that you can click on and learn more about. The ASRP Exchange was a webinar series that featured innovative, cutting-edge researchers funded through the Alzheimer's Society Research Program. And you can visit the website to have access to all of the past ASRP Exchange presentations featuring the Alzheimer's Society researchers. So you can see just kind of a screenshot of what that videos or what those videos look like above. Uh, and we can provide the link to that ASRP exchange in the notes at the end of the presentation. And in May of 2022, Alzheimer's Society of Canada launched a new webinar series called Dementia Talks. Um, and if you want to know what the latest research is saying about a topic uh, that's related to dementia or how people living with dementia and their care providers and families are being affected by a particular area of dementia research, then I would encourage you to tune into Dementia Talks. Dementia Talks are an online discussion series, which, are, which were created by the Alzheimer's Society of Canada and Brain Canada who are two of Canada's leading brain health organizations. And you can visit alzheimer.ca backslash talks for information about any upcoming presentations that they have planned. And you can also visit that same site to access video recordings of past Dementia Talks presentations. And those sessions include topics like uh, a session on concussion and brain injury and dementia, um, new dementia drugs and therapies, what Canadians should know, and on art and dementia, which features a speaker uh, that we highlighted today, a researcher as well that we highlighted today in our presentation, Dr. Sherry Dupuy. As we come to the end of our presentation today, I wanted to share some information about your local Alzheimer's Society. We truly understand that living with and supporting someone with dementia is not easy. And we want you to know that you're not alone and the Alzheimer's Society is here to help. We have a range of supportive services designed to assist you in your journey. And on the slide in the picture in the top right corner, you can see our intake, co intake coordinator, Maddie. She's your first point of contact with the Alzheimer's Society of Peterborough, Port, the Lakes, Northumberland, and Halliburton. And through Maddie's role, she can connect you with the right person and the right resources to really meet your needs. The re research initiatives that we discussed in this presentation are made possible by the contributions of our generous donors. Additionally, gifts from donors allow us to provide programs, care and support to people living with dementia and their care partners right here in our local communities. We wanted to take a moment to acknowledge their important contributions and say thank you. And lastly, uh, I wanted to thank you for joining us today and spending the last hour with us. So at this time, we're going to stop recording and stop sharing the PowerPoint screen and open the floor up for questions.